Uh, yeah. Uh, family, y'all. Just keep it tight, keep it tight, keep it tight. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Here we go, here we go. Uh. And so Carl Reiner. We conclude this course with the Christology of Carl Reiner. And we could talk about the Christology of so many different theologians. It's just that, in my estimation, Carl Reiner was one who opened up the windows a little more than others in his time to let in some fresh air and to help us to begin thinking through Christology in ways different from these first councils of the church. So for Carl Reiner, instead of this diaphysitic Christology that Jesus is human and Jesus is God, and that's our focus right there, Rana was thinking, let's, instead of thinking of God and humans, or God versus human, let's think of God as human. Follow me now, because in the ancient Greek mind, we had set up various dualisms like body and spirit, good, bad, right, wrong, human, divine, all these dualisms. It's the 21st century. It's time for us to get over dualisms. Think of any dualism, it, it no longer is so clear, right? Everything is black and white. Wait a minute, you follow me? Not all things are so black and white. There are some things that are gray. Even our racial categories, if we're talking about colors, right? Right. The census comes out and we have various boxes we have to check to describe who we are. Whoa, well, what happens if I'm not his non-Caucasian, not Caucasian, not African-American, but somehow a blend of various backgrounds. It's not so clear, right? Gay, straight, right? When it comes to things like sexuality, wait a minute, it's not, things are not that clear. And so let's get over these dualisms and, and come up with other models. So for him, rather than this whole human-divine dualism, let's think of it as God as human. If God were to become human, what would that look like? Because perhaps what we have in Jesus is a picture of that, of what God would look like if God became human. So for Rahner, Jesus is not this exception to all of creation. Jesus is the Logos. Jesus is the eternal word, the only begotten Son of God from all of eternity. He's not unlike us in so many ways. He's not an exception. Instead, he's more of an archetype or an exemplification of what we could be. Think about that for a moment. So it's not this Jesus who is the eternal word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. It's not this high Christology. We're not starting there. We're starting with this low, Jesus is human like us. And what example can we get from Jesus for the living of our lives? If we believe that if God were to become human, it would look like Jesus. And what does that teach us about how it is that we should live? See the different starting point that that is? So in that, in that sense, then, Jesus is sort of like this goal or this thing that we esteem to be, this person that we esteem to be. Jesus was this loving and forgiving and inclusive person. How can we be loving and forgiving and inclusive as well? Jesus, then, for Rahner, is the perfect expression of God's logos, of God's plan. If God wished all of us to be a certain way, God would want us to be like Jesus. How is that for a beautiful theology? Right? That how it is that the human being is not a body with a soul. Again, it's going back to this old dualism, or body and soul. Wait a minute. Let's get rid of these dualisms. It's the 21st century now. Let's, let's step over those dualisms and start thinking in new ways. Rather than thinking of us, of us as being body and soul, let's think of us as being matter. The whole soul and everything, I mean, it's the 21st century. As scientists, we can't prove the existence of any soul. We can prove the existence of hearts and lungs and human bodies and brains and things like that. Follow me? So we are matter, and that we can prove. We, we matter, we come from dust. We come from this earth. We're matter, but we're matter that has become self-conscious. So let's think about that for a moment. What's the difference between me and Buster the dog? Buster the dog is matter as well and has a brain and lungs and a heart like me, is a mammal like me. But Buster knows when Buster is hungry. And so when Buster is hungry, Buster goes and looks for food, right? Buster doesn't know 
that he knows that he's hungry. Let me rephrase that. So when I'm hungry, I know that I know. That's called self-reflective consciousness. What makes the human different from any other animal on earth is that we know that we know. Other animals know, but they don't know that they know. You follow me? A parrot knows how to repeat words, but it doesn't know that it knows how to repeat words. Follow me? A monkey knows that it likes bananas. It knows how to open the bananas and how to eat the bananas, but it doesn't know that it knows. How are you different from that monkey? You know that you know. So Carl Rahner is proposing this shift in the way that we think of ourselves, that how all of us are matter, rather than think of us as this body-soul dualism, think of yourself as, as an animal, but what makes us different is that we know that we know, that we are self-conscious, his, the term that he uses is that we are spirit in the world. This world is material, but there's something about us that, that is this human spirit that causes us to somehow rise above and to be able to do the things that we do and to learn what we learn and to build buildings and cities and highways and to be able to fly an airplane. I mean, there's something about the human being, this spirit in this material world. So, Rahner talks about how it is that we've transcended levels of experience. Think about this for a moment. If, if you believe in the theory of evolution, that we were once monkeys or apes, right? We, we, we keep evolving in our existence. We've transcended various levels of existence. He always talks about the human being a, being, being a transcendent being, which means that we arrive at one point, and then we transcend it, right? As a society, we, we, we're continually transcending. Our children are going to transcend us in every way. And then, you know, we just keep transcending ourselves. And so, for Rahner, we transcend these levels of existence, and now we're on this higher level, in the same way that sort of like monkeys have evolved to standing up erect, and have evolved to eventually being what it is that we're doing. We keep transcending to higher and higher levels. And so, for Karl Rahner, anthropology, if we're talking about allergies, a few allergies that we talk about are theology, Theology is the study of theos, is a Greek word for God, theology. This course has been about Christology. Christology is the study of what? The study of Christ. But another scientific study, you could go to the University of Texas or any university and get a degree in it, is anthropology. What is anthropology the study of? It's the study of the anthropos, which is the fancy Greek word for the human being. So for Karl Rahner, anthropology is the hinge pin of his Christology. For him, Christology is anthropology. What you believe about Christ is related to what you believe about human beings. For him, in fact, not only is Christology anthropology, but theology is anthropology. You tell me your theology, and I can tell you what it is that you believe about human beings. Theology is anthropology. He talked about the human being is transcendence. We're, we're a transcendent being. That's one of his key concepts in his <laughs> philosophy and his theology. He talks about us being a, a kapox infiniti. We're capable of receiving the infinite. We're finite beings, but with this infinite, with infinite possibilities of receiving the infinite. We're always open to upwards. We're open to the infinite. With no end to our kapox day, our, our capacity for God. If we remember back to our course in, in an introduction to systematic theology, what we were talking about was how it is that, that God is sort of like this horizon of being. Will we ever be able to grasp, will we ever arrive at the horizon? The sun set over the horizon this evening. If I run in the direction of the horizon 10 feet, am I 10 feet closer to the horizon? No. The horizon just receded 10 feet. You follow me? And isn't that how it is with our being? The more, the closer that we get to something, it's sort of like we still don't know everything. It, it still transcends us. So how it is that we are always grasping for what's beyond our reach, but without reaching this horizon, which is God. It's a very dynamic view. So the Greeks, you know, with all of their talk of ousia and substance and all of that, that was very static. 
Rodman presents a very dynamic picture of God and our relationship to God. So there's no end to what we can become because we're, we're always going to higher levels. The only end at the end of that is what? The horizon is God. We're heading in the direction of God. We'll never be able to grasp God except one day in the beatific vision in death. Then we will have grasped God. Until then, we're simply we're on the way. And the, and the end that's in sight same with Jesus. Do you remember what Jesus was all about? He was preaching this Jewish notion of what's at the end of time when God is fully God. That's what Jesus was preaching. That's the end goal for Rahner as well. How it is that the only end, the only goal, is God. The infinite. For him, the human being keeps becoming. So we're really not human beings. Think about that one for a moment. You're not a human being. You're a human becoming. Ooh, that is profound. For the Greeks, the Greeks were all about being, usia, right? I'm a human being. No, you're not a human being. You are a human becoming. And every second, every minute, every hour, you are a different person than you were previously. Got news for you. You're leaving this class with different knowledge and different experiences than when you came in here. You're leaving a different person from when you came in. You're not a human being. You're a human becoming. And as we're becoming, what are we becoming? We're becoming more human. So this is profound. So divinity is not something that's added to us or that replaces our soul or anything like that. That, that somehow Jesus became more divine. No, Jesus became more human. And by becoming more fully human, we become divine. So the human can be divine, and the divine can be human with one nature. We call that human. The human being is what God would be if God could be human. God is Jesus, for instance, in, in the person of Jesus, we see what God would be if God could be human. And so we overcome this Greek metaphysics then, and so how does the word become flesh? We do that through our own kapax infiniti, this, this ca capacity that we have for the infinite of becoming fully human being. <coughs> God is becoming flesh in our becoming more and more human. Let me try that one more time. God becomes flesh when we become more human. The Incarnation... God becomes flesh as we become more human, as we become more like Jesus, more loving, forgiving, living in peace with one another. God becomes flesh. How's that for deep theology? And so, it's no longer this abyss with the divine being the antithesis of the human. We, we get rid of that abyss, the antithesis between the two, and Jesus is divine precisely by being fully human. Why is Jesus divine? Because he was fully human. When he looked at others, he didn't seek to exclude them, to keep them out. Didn't harbor hatred in his heart, no. He chose a different way. Because by, by becoming more human, he was divine. So how interesting, there's not this human versus divine, there's not this dualism between the two. Instead, it's not this you know, divine being added to the human or anything. It's a one nature Christology. We're overcoming this dualism of the two natures, the human and the divine. We're going to stop using those words human and divine. And we're just going to talk about us becoming more fully human, which means that we're becoming divine. As we're becoming, what's causing us to become? As Christians, we believe that that's God. We call it grace. It's by the grace of God that we're becoming whom we're becoming. And so there's this dynamism driving the world. It's not this conception of a static God. It's this God that's involved in drawing us toward God's self, making us more and more, making us become the persons that we're becoming. And so Jesus doesn't cease being human, and nothing is added to his nature. So what's the difference between Jesus and us? Is Jesus different from us? If so, he's different in degree and not in kind. Follow that now. 
So Jesus is not different in kind. See, all of these old theologians, they were talking about the eternally begotten Son of the Father. Okay, so Jesus is way different from us. Carl Ryan is saying, wait a minute, let's get rid of all that high Christology. Jesus is not that different from us. Let's start with a lower Christology. Start with Jesus. Human. Not Jesus is so different from us. He's the eternally begotten Son of God the Father Almighty. No. Let's start with how it is then that Jesus is different from us in degree. We're all human beings. Jesus was just more fully human, we might say. So who is Jesus? Jesus is the fullest historical expression of God, says Karl Rahner. When God expresses God's self, the fullest expression that we have of God historically was in the person of Jesus. In what Jesus did and what Jesus said, that is the fullest expression of God that we've seen in a human being. Or we could point to other examples with saints or holy persons in the church, right? Whether it's Mother Teresa or whatever holy figure, right, in whatever religion throughout the world, that person, somehow God is in that person. It's an expression of God in that person. So God doesn't put on clothing in humanity. God doesn't disguise God's self in humanity or somehow come into flesh. Instead, God is human for all eternity. And we can't think about God without thinking about ourselves, which is why Karl Rahner says the theology is anthropology. We can't think about God without thinking about ourselves. And so from that perspective then, of God being human for all eternity, the expression that, that Father Don Bugger would always use is that God is hell-bent. Think of Jesus dying for our sins. right? God is hell-bent on being human. It belongs to the very being of God to be human. Theology becomes anthropology here. It belongs to the being of God to be human. What does it mean to be God? To be God means to become human. So from that perspective then, human beings are simply another mode of being for God. We, if we choose, can be another mode of being through which God is. And God becomes. God becomes human through us. So, Jesus is God. What does that mean for Jesus in all of this? Rather than talking about Jesus as the eternally begotten Son of Father and all that? No. For Rhonda then, Jesus is God in God's other mode of being. When God chooses to be God in a different way, to be God in, in human flesh, God is Jesus. The human being is what God is, when God's image, when God images God's self, when God images God's self, got news for you, that's you, that's me, that's all of us here. When God images God's self, we, the human being, resolve. So human nature is not something alien from God, from the divine. It's not the human versus the divine. Instead, Rhonda's view is that it's impossible for God not to be human. It's impossible for God not to be human. If God wishes to become human, God doesn't need to take on another nature. God doesn't need to become human. God simply expresses another possibility of self-expressibility. And so when we talk about Jesus being the Son of God, that's simply a code word for Jesus being human. More human than his contemporaries. We hear all those other stories of the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief priests. Jesus was more fully human, more fully loving and forgiving and, 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 and capturing all of those virtues, values, than, than others. He was the Son of God. He was fully human. So when God wills to become non-God, follow this now, God, if, if, going back to like this imminent and economic trinity, the imminent trinity is God, wherever God is. When God wills to become non-God, what does God become? God becomes human. So humans are the self-expression of God. When God wills to become non-God, something other than God, what does God become? God becomes flesh. God becomes human. 
And so for Karl Rahner, <clears throat> that's why he was always fond of saying, the theology is Christology is anthropology. All these are all related. And so you don't have to start with all these Greek metaphysical notions of the one and the logos and all the creation spilling out of all that. All those ideas that came from other people's minds. Let's just start with our own human experience and that will help us to understand who Christ was more fully, if not more so, than all these Greek metaphysical notions that the church stamped with its seal of approval. These were daring things to be saying back in the time that Ron was writing. I mean, he really, when the time of the Second Vatican Council was, was opening and, and John XXIII said, let's open the windows of the church, Karl Rahner was helping to open the windows of the church. And so a summary of how he's helped us to overcome all of this classical Christology, which has comprised this last class then. Rodner says that the nature proper to Jesus is his human nature. We talk about Jesus being human and Jesus being divine. Wait a minute. Rodner says Jesus is human like us, differing only in degree, not in kind. And his humanity becomes divine through the actualization of the divine self gift, which simply means that when God becomes the non-God, God becomes human like us, and was most fully, historically, human in the person of Jesus. So Rahner doesn't have a, a schizoid Christology, a two-nature Christology. He has a one-nature Christology where Christ is human. Jesus is fully human, and because he's fully human, he's fully divine. So the human and divine are not two distinct modes of being. It's by becoming more fully human ourselves that we become divine. And so as a fully actualized human being, Jesus is the goal and the completion of the evolutionary process. And here, Rahner is starting to sound like another theologian, another Jesuit theologian, Pierre de Chardin, who was very influenced by evolution. He was an anthropologist who studied evolution and things like that, and was very caught up in these notions, where how it is that Rahner had this idea too, that Jesus is the goal of humankind. What Jesus was, that should be our goal, to be more and more like Jesus. Because by being fully human, and being obedient to death, death on a cross, you know, by being fully obedient to God, and fully human, that is the model that we have to, to, to which we can aspire. And that's how Jesus arrived at the fullness of his humanity. So for Rahner, there's no human and divine. He collapses it all into the human, and he makes the human divine. Follow me? So that being human is divine. So Jesus is not the exception to creation, but he is the fullest expression of creation. He is a free subject face to face with God. And isn't that what each of us in this room is? To become fully human, it's you and your relationship to God. How are you becoming more fully human? Like Christ. So, in Rahner's view, the humanity of Jesus is not joined to this logos, this Greek metaphysical notion. It's not so much about that, but that the humanity of Jesus is the logos in the world. When God totally expresses God's self in history, Jesus was was it. Jesus is God's fullest expression in history, we believe as Christians. And so humanity is not just some passive instrument for the Logos to jump into, rather humanity is the Logos expressed. God's word is expressed in us and through us. This is quite different from how we started this course, right? So instead, it's, it's a more dialectical notion of the Incarnation, rather than God jumping down from a cloud and becoming flesh in a person. No, this, this no, in this notion, it takes two for the Incarnation to happen. God gives of God's self, but then we respond to that. And that's what Jesus did. When God gave the gift of God's self, Jesus responded. And by be, being most fully human and doing the acts that he did, he is divine. And if we follow in those footsteps, then, we'll never be divine in the same... Well, during this earth, we strive toward that goal. 
Jesus is the goal toward which we, toward which we strive. By being fully human, Jesus was divine. That's a radically different idea from the first centuries of the church. But the first centuries of the church were thinking about this issue of Jesus through their lenses, in their vocabulary, in their, in their era. Karl Rahner simply said, okay, it's now the 1960s and 70s. I'm in a different context. How might we think differently about Christology and God becoming flesh? And that's the theology that resulted. So simply offering a different view of Christology. Yes, we could continue to parrot the theology of those past centuries. We could, don't get me wrong. There are lots of seminarians who are being trained in seminaries today to be able to parrot this theology. So we could come in and we could all, we could all learn all of these doctrines so that we can repeat them effectively. I mean, in many ways, that's what Father Jamie's doing. By teaching us history, he's repeating these stories. Do we want to just be able to repeat it? Or do we want to somehow see how it is that if we were to open the windows and the Spirit were to blow in, what it is that the Spirit might inspire among us? How it is that we might think about these things differently? Do we have to think what the church <laughs> thought during those first centuries in order to be faithful? Or are we more faithful when we ask questions and try to relate that tradition to what it is that we believe as individuals and as a church? And so that's the study of Christology. What it is that we believe about Christ and how that makes sense within our context. Yes, the church formulated various doctrines about Christ in various places by various people. We heard the history, right? Let's quick, let's do this thing while, before the Antiochians arrive, right? Whoever was, around, whoever was there during certain meetings in the church's history said certain things which have influenced the way that people thought about it for centuries. Do we need to continue thinking in that same way for the next 15 centuries? Or is there a way to begin imagining anew the place of Christ in this world and the relationship of the human and the divine, which is what the Christ story is all about.